Okay, great, here we are. Um, in the spring of 2020, meatpacking plants all over the world became hotspots for COVID-19 outbreaks. By April 27th, more than 5,000 meatpacking workers in 19 US states had tested positive for coronavirus. Fearful of spreading the disease and killing the workforce, 22 meatpacking plants across the country shut down and shelves in grocery stores all over the United States began running bare. But President Donald Trump using the Defense Production Act, a 1950s era law dating from the Korean War, ordered the plants to remain open and continue production. As the executive order signed by Trump stated, quote, such closures threaten the continued functioning of the national meat and poultry supply chain, undermining critical infrastructure during a national emergency. Meat packing workers were quickly designated as essential workers and ordered to stay on the job even though they risked their lives in the plants. In the same week, Trump issued an executive order banning entry for refugees and other immigrant workers on the grounds that they posed a threat to native born workers in, in contracting labor markets. Refugee admissions in the US had already been plummeting from a plan 115,000 in the last year of the Obama administration. The Trump administration had already reduced admissions to 15,000 for fiscal year 2020. But with the new executive order, the Trump administration shut down refugee admissions completely, saying that immigrant workers would push low wage American workers out of a labor market where unemployment was rising rapidly. The irony here is that very often meatpacking workers are refugees. While the greatest proportion of immigrants in US meatpacking are still from Mexico, over the last 10 years, the industry has increasingly been relying on refugees who are placed in the plants by the agencies who resettle them on behalf of the US government. <coughs> People from Myanmar, Somalia, Sudan, and other locations are now a vital source of workers for the meatpacking industry. Without an ongoing flow of refugee labor, the meatpacking industry can no longer function. This puts refugees in a curious position. They are both essential and prohibited, valorized as low wage workers doing dangerous jobs. At the same time, they are stigmatized as potential sources of infection and labor market disruption. In this paper, I want to try and understand the paradoxical status of being both essential and prohibited by rethinking the ways refugees are supposedly integrated into labor markets. We often think of refugee integration as a form of humanitarianism, particularly in the United States, where resettlement work is most often carried out by groups affiliated with churches and other religious organizations. Refugees are thought of as surplus populations, people contained in camps and excised from the workings of capitalism. With that frame of reference, integrating them into the labor market and re-including them in capitalist circulation as a form, uh, acts as a form of benevolence, a generous gift meant to re-endow the refugees with self-sufficiency and therefore dignity. But what happens when we think of, labor, of the insertion of refugees into the labor market, not as benevolence or as a gift, but as a form of expropriation? one that is essential to the workings of capitalism itself. In what ways does the drive to quarantine refugees in low wage jobs where English language skills are not required, a means of feeding the needs of capital rather than serving the refugees themselves? My argument here is threefold. First, that when refugee resettlement agencies place refugees in meatpacking, they are participating in what Marx called primitive accumulation. Second, that this form of primitive accumulation is made possible by the intersection of ideas of race and citizenship, which make refugees into stigmatized prohibited labor and confine them to a bounded racialized niche in the labor market. And finally, that this form of racial capitalism is essential to the capitalist economy as a whole which depends on racialized labor to keep vital infrastructures fun functioning. 
I want to argue then that integrating refugees into the labor market is not humanitarian action, but is in fact an indispensable part of the workings of capitalism that depends on their status as stigmatized workers to allow for the expropriation of unfree labor. I wanna begin then by talking a little bit about meatpacking as a niche in the labor market. The meatpacking industry has long depended on immigrant and racialized labor in the United States. In the late 19th and early 20th century, workers from Eastern Europe, then highly ethnicized and indeed racialized, did the dirty bloody work on the kill floors. As the meatpacking plants were moved out of urban areas and into small rural towns, the industry sought new workers. In poultry production, most of the workers in the mid 20th century were African American. But as African American workers began to unionize, the meatpacking industry sought laborers who were more vulnerable and less able to organize. Mexican and Guatemalan workers became a high volume source of labor to fill jobs that white Americans refused to do. In some cases, those workers were recruited in Mexico and brought to the United States on H2B visas, which are for temporary non-resident agricultural workers. Um, indeed, when I lived in Longmont, Colorado, there was actually a bus stop outside a turkey processing plant and workers were being loaded onto buses in Durango, Mexico and bused straight to the turkey plant. But more often, um, the workers in the packing plants had either overstayed their visas or were undocumented to begin with. On December 12, 2006, over 1,000 agents from US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, raided six plants owned by Swift and Company in the largest immigration raid in US history. More than 12,000 workers were detained in the plants and nearly 1,300 were eventually arrested and sent to federal detention centers. The plants had to shut down for days and eventually lost nearly 10% of their staff as workers, um, as workers were arrested and then deported. But the cost to the firm from these raids was in the millions of dollars, and it highlighted, highlighted how financially vulnerable a dependence on undocumented labor made the meatpacking industry. The SWIFT raids opened a new, much more aggressive era in immigration policy in the United States. The government's goal was to force the meatpacking industry to hire US citizens. But as a meatpacking industry lobbyist told me, there were two problems with this strategy. First, meatpacking is the most dangerous job in America, according to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the most white Americans refused to do it. Second, the growing opioid crisis in rural America made native born white workers in rural towns a risk to the company. As the lobbyist told me, heroin and meat saws are a bad mix. Companies like Swift and JBS, the Brazilian meatpacker that bought Swift in 2005, needed a source of vulnerable, exploitable labor that was nonetheless legal they soon turned to refugee resettlement agencies, which were struggling after, 2000, after the 2008 recession to place newly arriving refugees in jobs that did not require English language skills. In Greeley, Colorado, undocumented Mexican workers at the JBS plant were replaced with Somalis, people placed there by the African Community Center and Lutheran Family Services, two resettlement agencies in Denver who were contracted by the US federal government to find housing and jobs for newly arriving refugees. The Somalis were more tractable than US citizens, either white or minority who could unionize. But they posed another problem. Religious Muslims, they demanded that the processing line shut, uh, shut down five times a day so they could pray during Ramadan. Since line shutdowns cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per minute, JBS was reluctant to accommodate them and demanded that they continue working. Uh, sorry, I lost that for a second. Um, the meat packers now needed a still legal but less religious set of workers. Other plants had been hiring refugee workers from Southeast Asia for decades, 
In Garden City, Kansas, for example, Vietnamese and Lao refugees had staffed the plant, plant since the mid 60s. So in Greeley, the JBS beef packing plant began hiring newly arriving Rohingya workers from Burma. Again, mostly placed there by refugee resettlement agencies. The Rohingya were Muslim, but less observant and did not demand line shutdowns. In Logansport, Indiana, uh, Exodus Refugee Immigration, uh, which is a group I'm on the board of, placed Karen and Kareneni workers in a pork processing plant owned by Tyson Foods. So Rohingya and Burmese workers in general became a major source of labor for meatpacking. Increasingly, the cheap meat that makes up such a high proportion of the all-American diet was produced by refugee workers brought from far away. I wanna talk now a little bit theoretically about refugees and racial capitalism. Given that meatpacking jobs are dangerous, underpaid, and deeply unpleasant, why do refugees do them? If refugees are in fact free labor, voluntarily selling their time and effort to an employer, why do they sell their labor to meatpackers? I argue that in fact, refugee labor is not free labor. The US resettlement coerces labor from refugees, funneling them into a labor market niche that is marked by ideologies of both race and statelessness. Unlike most European countries, the US resettlement system provides remarkably little help to newly arriving refugees. In Germany, for example, refugees are given state subsidized housing for months or even years, along with mandatory language and civics courses. In the US, by contrast, help is scant. The US Department of State loans refugee money for their plane tickets to the US, but demands repayment within the first year which means that all refugees arrive already thousands of dollars in debt. Resettlement agencies rent apartments for them and furnish them with secondhand furniture, kitchen equipment, bedding, and so on. Refugees get 90 days of rent and up to 180 days of paid electricity and gas, along with $425 per person in cash assistance for clothing and other needs. Most refugees are eligible for Medicaid, which is state-funded health care, and other state-sponsored social benefits, but these are not enough to lift them out of poverty. The goal, as outlined by the U.S. Department of State, is for refugees to be economically self-sufficient within three months of their arrival. For resettlement agencies and the refugees they serve, this enormous financial pressure creates a strong incentive for refugees to be placed in jobs as quickly as possible. These jobs are at the bottom of the economic pecking order. In addition to food processing, refugees often work in fulfillment warehouses like Amazon's. They clean hotel rooms or they do assembly line work. Although meatpacking pays more than many entry level jobs in the retail sector, an average of $14.75 an hour, as opposed to the minimum wage, which ranges from $7.25 an hour in Indiana or $12 an hour in Colorado. The annual wage that most workers earn is far, it's just far enough above the poverty line to disqualify them from most federal aid programs while not being enough to actually make ends meet. The actual cost of living for a family of four on Colorado's front range, where skyrocketing property values have driven up rents, is about $59,000. A full-time employee in JBS's Greeley plant makes $29,000 a year. This clearly creates enormous pressure on refugee families who must also pay for childcare or have a non-working adult at home. Working in jobs American citizens will not do quickly becomes necessary for survival. Once refugees have entered low skill, low English jobs, they are often stuck there. Shift work and a lack of transportation precludes attending English classes at resettlement agencies. And because these people work with other people from their language group, many of them do not learn English on the job. Exiting these labor market niches is nearly impossible. The cycle of low wage work and the inability to gain new skills means that the jobs that welcome them quickly become prisons. 
Meatpacking is what economists call a labor market niche. That is a specific line of work or a segment of an occupation that's dominated by a defined social group. Label, labor market niches are often defined by skill sets. A particular group has a lock on the skills necessary to do the job. So artisanal furniture makers or rug weavers who pass skills from generation to generation. But labor market niches in the US are often also defined in terms of ethnicity as when Vietna Vietnamese nail salons recruit new workers among their own co-ethnics. The development of immigrant niches in labor markets is not new. It's a well-documented feature of economies in both Europe and North America. But this has mostly been explained as something that immigrants do preferentially for themselves by hiring co-ethnics in businesses they own or referring co-ethnics to their employers to build so-called immigrant enclave economies. That is to say, immigrant niches are generally seen as the product of free labor, of working people who can choose whether and where to sell their own labor. Meat packing, however, is not a labor market niche defined by skill. And as the switch from Mexican to Somali to Rohingya workers in Greeley shows, it is also not defined by ethnic networks. Rather, the niche is defined by coercion. Refugee labor niches are made by refugee resettlement agencies who pressure refugees to take low, rate, low wage, dangerous jobs because the refugees are in debt and must be self-sufficient quickly, but also because the refugee resettlement agencies themselves are being coerced by the Department of State to place refugees as quickly as possible. The meatpacking labor niche is also defined by vulnerability. Refugee workers are hired preferentially in meatpacking expressly because they don't have the capacity for easy exit and are so much more docile, much easier to coerce into doing work that others will not. Like undocumented workers in other parts of agriculture, for example, farm workers from Mexico, their legal status, socially disdained ethnic identities and lack of English skills make it nearly impossible for them to organize, strike, or use any of the other tools of labor activism developed in the 19th and 20th centuries. It is also proven to be nearly impossible for refugees to simply quit their jobs, even when their very lives are at stake. Refugee um, meat packers largely kept working during the COVID pandemic, even though by September 2020, more than 42,534 workers had tested positive in 494 packing plants, and over 203 meat packing workers had died. And this billboard is a, a sign that the labor union posted in front of the packing plant in Greeley. So let's talk then about unfree labor. <clears throat> labor market niches where refugees are employed are not the product of free labor, of voluntary placement in an ethnicized industry where individual workers can work their way up in the American economic hierarchy. Refugee workers are not quite slaves, but they are also not the mobile free wage laborers who can withdraw their labor easily and move it to the highest bidder. They hover uncomfortably on the boundary between free and unfree labor, becoming a stream of highly coerced or constrained workers brought in across a capitalist frontier because exploiting it is necessary to the continuation of a capitalist industrial sector. In fact, I would argue it's necessary to all capitalist industrial sectors. In his analysis of capitalism, Marx argued that the use of unfree labor is foundational to capitalism. Slave labor was part of what Marx called primitive accumulation, or a moment in which initial capital is accrued through the violent seizure of labor, land, or other resources. In Marx's rendering, primitive accumulation for the beginning of capitalism is the equivalent of the Big Bang for the beginning of the universe. It is a violent process that nonetheless is just a one-off moment since it begins a cycle that otherwise afterwards is self-sustaining. Violent coercion is necessary for capitalism only once, says Marx, 
because afterwards the structure of economic relations themselves compel workers to sell their labor. Slavery thus be, appears to become quickly unnecessary and outdated because the wage relationship itself does the work of enslavement while maintaining the facade of free choice. Cedric Robinson in his foundational work, Black Marxism written in 1983 disputes this view of primitive accumulation. Instead, he argues, the constant production and introduction of unfree labor into the capitalist system is essential to its functioning. Although we often associate the relationship of enslaved labor to capitalism with colonialism, Robinson argues that the category of the slave and the use of enslaved labor predated Europe's relationship with Africa and was co-emergent with capitalism itself. Among the traders of the Mediterranean in the 13th to 15th centuries, enslaved Tatars, Circassians, Slavs, and others became essential to the workings of merchant capitalism. Medieval intra-European slavery then was the model for African slavery. Robinson's point here is twofold. First, he argues that the introduction of unfree labor into the capitalist system is not the the result of the specific racial differences between Europeans and their colonial others. Rather, he argues, capitalism itself is dependent for its functioning on the production of human difference and on the production of race, relations of inequality. And it produces those relations with ideologies of race and racism. It is only by ideologically producing a marked group as racially inferior that their labor can be seized from outside the capitalist system, violently expropriated, and then appropriated into capitalist production and circulation. As Jody Melamed uh, rephrases his point, capitalism is racial capitalism. Capital can only be capital when it is accumulating, and it can only accumulate by producing and moving through relations of severe inequality among human groups. These antinomies of capitalist accumulation require loss, disposability, and the unequal differentiation of human value. And racism enshrines the inequalities that capitalism requires. Second, Robinson argues that although primitive accumulation through violent appropriation of enslaved labor is essential for capitalism, it did not and does not happen in an originary big bang moment. Rather, capitalism requires that the violent appropriation of unfree labor happen continually. As scholars, including Robinson, but also Sidney Mintz or Michel Rolf Puyot have argued, slave labor was not just necessary for the initial production of capitalism writ large, but for the ongoing reproduction of wage labor and the circulation of capital in general. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the seizure and enslavement of African people was essential to the production of sugar in the Caribbean. That sugar, along with other slave produced crops, including cocoa, coffee, and tea, was what made it possible to feed urban workers in England, people who had been violently separated from their lands by the Enclosure Acts and forced to move into the cities to work in the newly emerging factories. The industrial revolution and the development of industrial capital thus depended on the constant application of unfree labor. Wage labor, which was indirectly coercive, depended for its very existence on the direct coercion of the slave system. Shea Friedland, in a brilliant analysis, calls this the capitalist frontier. A capitalist frontier is the boundary between capitalist and non-capitalist worlds. As world systems theorists, theorists argued in the 80s and 90s, capitalism's restless expansion depends for its very existence on these frontiers, on the ability to draw what is outside itself into itself, relentlessly commodifying and appropriating whatever it encounters, transforming it into capital, and launching it into circuits of transformation into goods and money. These processes of incorporation, as the world systems theorists called it, are mostly thought of geographically, 
as a problem of how capitalism incorporates far-flung regions into increasingly distant circuits of capital circulation. But rather than thinking of the problem in terms of geographically fixed locations and frontiers that move across space, we can think of the frontier as being embodied in people, in people who are mobile, people who bring the frontier of primitive accumulation with them as they move into the heartland of capitalist production. Like other forms of immigrant labor, refugees embody capitalism's mobile frontier. <clears throat> Unlike many other kinds of labor migrants, however, refugees mark a special kind of frontier, one in which unfree labor is brought into the ambit of capitalist circulation for the continual reproduction of primitive accumulation. Refugee labor. Like the slave labor that produced the food that fueled the Industrial Revolution, is literally essential to the reproduction of wage labor. <clears throat> Without the cheap pork and beef and chicken that refugee workers produce, other wage workers in the US and abroad would be literally unable to feed themselves and reproduce their own labor. So President Trump was not wrong when he proclaimed meatpacking to be critical infrastructure and meatpacking workers to be essential workers. And that is the one and only time I will ever in my life agree with Trump. Their in-person work, which puts them at high risk of exposure to COVID was necessary so that other workers could work remotely, thus reducing their risk of exposure and keeping the nation's infrastructure operating. As Andrew Lakoff writes, at the heart of the essential worker policy was an assumption that the well-being of the collective depended on securing the continuous flow of re resources through a set of vital yet vulnerable systems. As Gavin Newsom, the governor of California wrote in his executive order permitting essential workers to break the stay at home order, the supply chain must continue. The continuity of the essential supply chain then and the vital infrastructures it supported thus depended on an ideology of race that stigmatized refugee workers and compelled them to work in this sector and it also depended on the relation, the production of relations of severe inequality that, may, that made up not just different wage rates, but violence in the form of different exposures to risk and to disease. So if refugees are at the edge of the capitalist frontier, we should talk about statelessness then as a frontier making device. For refugee workers, ideologies of race are not the only ideological formations that confine them to low paid dangerous labor. Statelessness too is an ideological construct that works with capitalist economies to create labor streams. Although refugees are defined exclusively in terms of politics, indeed, this is what separates them from labor migrants. Politics and economics are not in fact analytically separable. Here, I argue that statelessness is what constitutes refugees as a capitalist frontier, <clears throat> as a site where what is outside capitalism can be brought inside it as a form of ongoing primitive accumulation of unfree labor. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, refugees have often been defined as people outside the nation state system. That is, as people whose sole defining characteristic is the political condition of statelessness. In the origins of totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt argued that in a world where both civic and human rights were upheld solely by nation states, refugees were de facto rightless precisely because they had been thrown out of the nation state system altogether. But refugees were not just thrown out of political community, but often economic community. Host states have often held refugees in closed camps not just because camps makes, make delivering aid easier, but because the closed camp prevents refugees from joining local labor markets. Barred from legal wage labor, dependent on aid given to them outside the market, even prevented from acting as consumers as, of locally produced goods, 
The ideal typical refugee in a closed camp is as excluded from capitalism as from citizenship. It is this ideal typical view of refugees that led Zygmunt Bauman to characterize them as superfluous populations who could not even make their own living. People who had been tossed out of modernity itself and thrown into camps that functioned as garbage dumps for what Bauman referred to as human waste. As anyone who has worked with refugees knows, Bauman's formulation of refugees as people completely outside capitalism is dead wrong. <clears throat> in almost every camp in the world, refugees remain embedded in capitalism. They work often as undocumented workers making less than the local population. They trade sometimes openly, sometimes illicitly, sometimes across borders with their country of origin. They buy consumer goods above and beyond what they receive in aid. Refugees who refuse to enter the camp system are even more embedded in capitalist markets, working licitly or illicitly, often in low paid, high risk environments. Yet because refugees have been forced outside capitalism and then tenuously reintegrated into it, their participation in capitalism is markedly degraded. They are driven into low wage, low status occupations um, they trade in makeshift bazaars or out of their homes rather than opening storefronts. They buy fewer and cheaper goods than they did before displacement. Becoming stateless does not force refu refugees outside capitalism, but it places them on its margins in precarious circumstances, hovering between being free and unfree labor and consumers with and without choices always on the verge of following, falling out of the capitalist system again. If, as Jody Melamed argues, capitalism depends for its existence on the production of human inequality, then statelessness is surely one way that this inequality is produced. Ideologies that stigmatize refugees pile onto the mere fact of statelessness when refugees are seen as job stealers or terrorists or potential biological contaminants or worse, the violent production of inequality is legitimated and made to seem normal or even natural. Anti-refugee sentiment thus functions in the same way that racism does, to make possible the appropriation of unfree human labor necessary to the continued functioning of capitalism. There has been a great deal of discussion in geography lately on the idea of a mobile border. Arguing that the state's regulation of migrants inside its own geographical frontiers effectively makes borders elastic and it makes bordering into a highly mobile practice, anthropologists and geographers have come to see the borders between nation states as embodied in border crossers themselves who become not only the target of state regulation, but the very site at which statehood is enacted. Likewise, we can see refugees as embodying the mobile border between capitalism and everything outside it. In an interesting take on refugees and urban development, Friedland argues that the condition of statelessness makes it possible for municipal governments in host countries, including the US, to put the burden of urban development on the backs of refugees. Because refugees in places like Colorado cannot support themselves and their families in a high cost of living area on the wages they make, they rely on family members in less developed countries to send them remittances. And indeed, Friedland documents remittances coming from Malaysia to refugee workers in the US. This money flows into the local economy in a host municipality, driving up the cost of housing, supporting local businesses, bringing in tax revenue, and so on. The municipality also relies on refugees' unpaid labor, particularly the unpaid labor of women who volunteer in schools, supervise their children's education, and spare the, system, uh, the school system the need to hire more teachers or translators work unpaid as so-called natural helpers to resettle other refugees and so on. 
Local firms rely on refugee workers to donate to the Helping Hands Fund at work in order to support other workers in times of crisis. And they demand emotional labor from workers to smooth over the differences among workers that impede production. Families, non-capitalist reproductive labor in both second countries and in the host country, thus quickly becomes appropriated by both the state and capitalist businesses as it flows between and through refugees living, working bodies. The refugees themselves come to mark the capitalist frontier, the boundary between industrial capitalism and its other, and the site where capitalism can engage in primitive accumulation to seize resources from outside itself in order to sustain itself. What we see among refugee meatpackers thus is what Ruthie Wilson Gilmore has called anti-relationality. She argues that in the service of capitalism, states and other actors use race to produce group, what she calls group differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death in distinct yet densely interconnected political geographies. That is, Gilmore argues that the states and capital working together separate groups of people spatially and socially and assign them different values only so that they can be reconnected in ways that serve the economic system. For Gilmore, ideologies of race are the tool that allows this process of separation, distinction, devaluation, and reconnection to occur. But ideologies that render people stateless and then stigmatize them for their statelessness work in the same way. They divide people into groups of citizens and non-citizens, assign nefarious characteristics to non-citizens, relegate them to ethnic enclaves or ghettos, and drive them into labor market niches of low-wage, dangerous jobs. The stigmatization of refugees is not an add-on to capitalism that can be removed while still integrating refugees into labor markets. That stigmatization is the very condition of possibility for those niches. Without it, refugees or undocumented people could not be made to take jobs that other people will not. Let me wrap up. <clears throat> we very often think of the need to integrate refugees into the labor market as a humanitarian imperative, granting them dignity, self-sufficiency, choice, and other neoliberal virtues. Among scholars, refugee resettlement agencies and host governments, integrating resettled refugees in labor markets is seen as crucial to successfully integrating them politically and socially. Getting jobs for refugees is supposed to reduce their reliance on local welfare systems, which in neoliberal ideologies is the ultimate good, and to reduce local prejudice against them by proving their self-sufficiency and their contributions to the local economy because this is seen as a politically winning argument. Pro-resettlement activists increasingly define refugees not by their economic need or their political or social vulnerability, but by their value to capitalist economies as workers and consumers. And um, I myself have done this as a pro-refugee activist. And uh, in the Q&A, maybe I can tell you the story about cornering Mike Pence's brother on an airplane and making this argument. Um, Resettlement activists aim to show that the cost of resettling people must be overcome by the economic value they produce. And they argue that the economic value they produce is key to overcoming discrimination against them. They used to sarcastically joke about Schrodinger's refugee, somebody who was too lazy to work but still stealing your job. By this, I meant to point out the fundamental illogic of ideologies that argue that um, refugees are both illegitimate recipients of state benefits because they won't work and people willing to work so hard in such horrible conditions and for such low wages that they steal jobs from American citizens. In this paper, however, I show that the juxtaposition of these two arguments is not illogical or irrational. Instead, I've argued that being essential to the functioning of the entire capitalist system and being stigmatized and prohibited by it are not antithetical, as crazy as President Trump's simultaneous declarations about 
refugee meatpacking workers might seem. Refugees can be both essential and prohibited at the same time because being essential and prohibited are components of the ways that a labor market niche for unpleasant, brutal, and dangerous work is built and the ways that people are rendered vulnerable enough to be coerced into doing it. The ideologies that stigmatize refugees, the political status of statelessness that disempowers them, and their economic segregation into low-wage, high-risk work are therefore foundational elements of their integration into market capitalism. That's, that is to say, they are integral elements of the capitalist system, not just unfortunate anomalies. What this means is that just like we can't think about capitalism and racism as separate but unfortunately linked phenomena, we also can't think about capitalism and forced migration separately. Capitalism is a system that essentially depends on the social division of the population into citizens and non-citizens. It depends on the production of vulnerability and economic desperation among non-citizens. It depends on the stereotyping and vilification of forced migrants, their exposure to life-threatening risks and the appropriation of their labor. If capitalism is racial capitalism, it is also refugee capitalism. As we think about labor market integration for refugees, it is high time we began thinking about them as essential workers, essential to the very continuation of the American economy and the American way of life rather than as the beneficiaries of our charity. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, okay, so I think the floor is open now for questions. Uh, please indicate if you'd like to ask a question in the chat box or write your question in the chat box, uh, whichever form is more, uh, is better for you. Agnieszka, using my um, using my kind of co-hosting privileges, I wanted to ask uh, a question. If that's okay, yeah. um, uh, my I I was really uh, taken by um, the story of how undocumented workers were moved away from uh, from the meatpacking factory in order to kind of provide space or which resulted into there being space for various um, groups of refugees and how this kind of this process worked. Um, and in your conclusion then, I think you've maybe nodded or I've read it into <coughs> your conclusion. This not a this like overlap or blurring of the negative stereotypes about refugees and undocumented workers. And this definitely happened in Poland in terms of our discourse on refugees and undocumented uh, workers and this insistent, this ascribing of virtue to one and nefarious intent to the other. And I'm wondering if you could speak, I mean, I want to hear the anecdote about accosting um, family members of politicians, but on top of that, uh, if you could kind of disambiguate uh, or talk about this kind of relation between undocumented workers and refugees and how it plays out both in kind of those discourses that you were describing, but also the realities, because I find it fascinating, um, um, fascinating in its similarity and difference, basically. Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting paradoxes of the anti-immigrant movements during the Trump administration, um, and by the way, it's really excellent to talk about that in the past tense. Um, but one of the interesting phenomena there is that the same people who supported that into anti-immigrant rhetoric were very often dependent on immigrant labor. <clears throat> so for example, farmers in the Central Valley of California were completely in favor of closing the border and deporting undocumented workers until they found out that there was no one to pick their crops. And it's really interesting that they had not seen that potential pitfall of, of being anti-immigrant. Um, and I think that prior to COVID-19, the unemployment rate in the United States had declined to 2.9%, which is historically low. Um, at 
at below 3%, basically, the labor market locks up. You, you can't move workers easily from one sector to the other. And we had always solved that problem in the United States by using undocumented people as kind of a reserve army of the, in, of the unemployed who could be called into service when the labor market was tight and then deported when you needed to reduce unemployment for native workers. And once that was shut down by the Trump administration, what we started to find out is that growth was being locked up. And so in Indiana, for example, we had companies, I mean, you would see hiring signs all over the place, um, all for low wage jobs, almost exclusively for low wage jobs. And you could see that companies were unable to expand production because of labor shortage. And so the Trump administration caused that particular quandary to get worse and worse. And if it hadn't been for COVID, I think growth in the economy would have been severely affected by it. Um, meat packers in particular, but also in other industries, found um, the use of refugee labor to be a really good substitute for that because those people were seen as sort of here fairly and it was humanitarian to give them jobs. And so that you could make a case, a moral case for hiring them instead of undocumented workers. But the truth is that they are also an elastic labor force um, and, and they're being used to replace undocumented workers or they're being put in competition with undocumented workers. Uh, okay, we also have a question from Agnieszka Graf. So Agnieszka, uh, please ask a question. Hello, first of all, hello, um, Elizabeth. I'm really happy to have you at ASA, even if it's, it's nice virtual, to see you. and to, to see you after the Trump, uh, after the end of the Trump presidency. Um, my question is pretty simple. Do you think um, Biden will change things significantly in, this, in, the, in the realm of conditions of labor and legal status of refugees, but also in the, um, with regard to attitudes towards um, the exploitation and stigmatization of refugees? And my other question is kind of linguistic. In Poland, during the anti-refugee scare um, in 2015, one of the operative uh, uh, differences was between immigrants and refugees. And the right uh, basically refused to use the word refugees, and they either called them immigrants, insisting that they that that they're coming here to make money, um, or they called them barbarians, and they used the rhetoric of invasion. And I wonder about the meaning of the word refugee in the American mainstream. Is it stigmatizing, or is there a kind of um, you know positive uh, spin to it, as in refugee is someone who needs our help? Yeah. So I think um, the first question is is easy to answer, or at least partially. In, in the first 24 hours of the Biden administration, <clears throat> Biden reset, announced that he would reset the cap on the number of refugees who could be admitted from uh, 11,000, which is what Trump authorized for the coming fiscal year, to 115,000. So it's unclear how many people we can actually take in because this resettlement system has been so damaged by the Trump administration, which was the point of limiting um, resettlement because agencies are paid on a per refugee basis. So when there's no arrivals, um, they go out of business and many of them have closed. Um, so can we scale back up that fast? I don't know, but Biden has said that he will now admit between 115 and 150,000 people every year while he's president. So, um, and, and the US labor market has absorbed in even greater volume of refugees before. When you think about the Vietnamese boat people um, and you count people admitted as refugees plus their family members who were later admitted, um, the US admitted and absorbed over 2 million people in a 12 year span. So it's certainly, I think, doable. Um, he, he's also put a moratorium on deportations and shut down any building of the wall. So um, he's signaling that he will handle undocumented migration and asylum seeking in a different way. Um, exactly what's gonna come of that, I don't know. Um, he also this, this morning fired um, 
fired a, the head of the National Labor Relations Board, or sorry, the council, lead council for the National Labor Relations Board, who was widely seen as anti-union. So I think we'll see a much more pro-union environment, which could lead to improvements in working conditions. The meat packers have said that if they don't get an improved flow of refugee labor, that they're just going to mechanize. And that will destroy these little towns who depend on those workers as consumers for their businesses. So I, it's interesting that you see a lot of pressure for refugee admissions coming from the mayors of small towns. And um, when I was ghostwriting for a national refugee uh, resettlement agency, I actually got a, an op-ed in the New York Times, uh, not under my name. Interestingly, I was, I was, it was, I wrote it, but the op-ed was signed by the mayor of Ottumwa, Iowa, saying basically my town needs refugees and if you don't send them, the town is gonna collapse. So that'll be really different. Um, you asked an interesting question about, about rhetoric. And the thing that is amazing to me is how fast the moral valence of the word refugee changed. And I remember in 2015, um, we were involved here in Bloomington uh, in a plan to expand uh, refugee resettlement and make Bloomington a national resettlement site. You have to have an agency that will sponsor it. Um, and, and we walked into that completely thinking that this word refugee was positive, that people would see what we were doing as humanitarian action, um, that they would see it as necessary help to people who were suffering through no fault of their own. I mean, that seemed self-evident to me. And it was so not self-evident because um, although we had you know, hundreds of people signing up to help, we also had a really much smaller but much more vocal group of people who started demonizing refugees and calling them vectors for disease. And my favorite was this woman claiming that if we admitted Syrians here, that they would start stoning the female students because they were dressed too skimpily. We're a university town. So um, claims that the town would be run under Sharia law, um, claims that they would bring in cholera. I mean, the, the things they were saying were just crazy and you would correct those things thinking that it was an information problem and then they would be repeated at the next meeting. And although everything they were saying was demonstrably false, what they succeeded in doing was changing the emotional tenor of that word refugee. And I think they succeeded at it brilliantly. So that for many people now, refugee is not the object of pity, but seen as someone who is a potential security threat. <clears throat> Um, thank you for your answers. Do we have other questions? Perhaps some, someone else would like to ask a question via the chat box or mic. Well, why everyone thinks of a question. I have, I have a short question. Uh, it's just something that I didn't manage to note down um, during your lecture. You mentioned capitalism frontier. So not, not frontier capitalism, but capitalism frontier. Could you, um, could you repeat? perhaps repeat the, the, the reference or can I explain it uh, once again sure. um, a little bit more? Yeah, so, so capitalism has always had places that are outside itself, right? Places where goods or labor are not commodified. And I think originally we think of those places as being geographical, right? So when the British East India Company comes to India, it's introducing capitalist logics to a place that is not capitalist. And, and it starts to absorb these places and their social structures into a logic of capitalism that commodifies the people and things, turns labor into something that can be sold and exports the products of it back to the the epicenter of industrial capitalism. Um, and, and I think for a long time that thinking about the ways that capitalism as a system expanded was thought of as geographical expansion. 
And so in the, in the 80s, you got these really interesting discussions of the ways that capitalism spread around the world. And I'm thinking here, particularly of um, the world systems theorists um, and the people they influenced, like um, a lot of anthropologists who were doing commodity studies. So Sid Mintz's work on the peasants of the Caribbean was really significant because his argument was that they got drawn, they weren't outside capitalism, but they got drawn into capitalism um, in a way that was necessary for capitalism to exist at all. But now I think we can pretty much say that every place in the world is capitalist, that there are almost no places that are somehow free from capitalism. So it's not about just geographic expansion anymore, but also about getting people who are embedded in one kind of capitalism or who are marginally embedded in capitalism and drawing them into the heartland of industrial production so that their labor becomes more valuable. So, um, so uh, Shay Friedland, who's, who was my postdoc, who is my postdoc, was doing this great work on Rohingya people who were involved in bird's nest production in Malaysia. They were, they were helping harvest and clean these bird's nests for, for export to China where bird's nest soup is a delicacy. And it, this involves spending hours with tweezers, picking the feathers out of bird's nests. And, and these women are paid you know, virtually nothing and the margin on bird's nests is, is not really great. Um, <clears throat> so their labor wasn't, it was, it was casual day labor. <clears throat> Excuse me, they didn't have contracts. They didn't have long-term work. They were sort of marginal to the capitalist system. And then they get picked up and moved to Colorado and all of a sudden they're in a, a beef processing plant. They're, the frontier between one kind of capitalism and another now is in the person who's moving, not in the movement of the industry. So it's not like the tea industry expanding into India. It, it's that so that it can take advantage of labor in a place. It's that an industry is moving labor into it. So the border between capitalism and non-capitalism is in the person themselves and in, in their labor, which is much of it unpaid and appropriated by capitalism anyway. Thank you for that. That that I now understand it much better. Thank you. Uh, Jakub Oleg would like to ask a question. Um, yeah, so um, I would like to ask a question because so uh, Trump's administration was in the first period in the history of the US when um, immigration was highly uh, was being highly limited, and I am thinking here about the eugenics movement and the interwar period. Um, so, were implications of the of the limiting of immigration into the U.S. back then um, in any way similar to, to what was happening now, or are there any par parallels to be drawn, or was a capitalist system simply not as developed back then for it to impact um, the, the whole system as much? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in that period of history, but I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking in particular about the sort of anti-Chinese legislation or immigrant restriction legislation, which was aimed at blocking laborers from China from coming in. And one of the interesting things about that period in time is that although there were these supposed caps on legal immigration, um, there was still significant immigration of Chinese people who were needed by the railroad industry uh, in particular. So, um, but also in, in California agriculture. So I think one of the interesting parallels is that when, um, when industries have a need for labor, they pull labor in even when the state is trying to block it. And that's been true during the Trump administration. You know, you, we still have less but still fairly significant labor flows into the United States. What has stopped is circular migration. So people can't leave, you know, especially people from Mexico would leave in the winter uh, 
go back home for the winter and then come back up in the spring following the, the strawberry crop or the lettuce crop. And now they, they feel that they cannot leave because they might not enter again. Um, but I don't think that the labor flow um, has been as impacted as the Trump administration hoped it would be. So I, that's an interesting parallel for me. Um, uh, but you suggest that I should look into this more deeply and I think I will. Thank you. Mm, do we have other questions? So if I may once again ask a, ask a question, um, I was wondering, I think you've hinted at the ways in which your approach to uh, refugee activism has changed, if I understood correctly. Uh, kind of, uh, could you expand on that? Like what, how, how did your, your kind of thinking about it developed in, in recent years? Um, what did you find that works effectively? Um, if you could expand on that. Yeah, well, you know, one of the interesting, so to just back up a second, I am the um, executive director of a small refugee serving organization here in Bloomington. And I also am a, the member of a board, uh, an executive board of a larger federally funded refugee resettlement agency in Indianapolis, which is about an hour away from here. Um, so Indiana is a deep red state. It is super, super Republican. Mike Pence is from Indiana. He was our governor. Um, and so making the case for admitting refugees in this environment has been super challenging. And we certainly realized after 2015, after we got broadsided by this group called the Grassroots Conservatives, and they were so agitated, by the way, they were also crazy that at one point we're in the basement of the Methodist church and they start a fist fight with my people and we had to call the police um, because they're swinging punches. We're being physically assaulted by these people. I mean, it was crazy. Kind of, a, we should have seen that as a preview of, of the violence that was coming and their willingness to use violence in the service of this ideology. Um, but we were really naive. Um, so one of the things we realized very quickly is that we had to make a case for refugee resettlement and we couldn't make it ourselves. That there were too many hardline pro-Trumpers in Indiana for a refugee serving organization to make the argument. So what we wanted to do was enlist moderate Republicans to make this argument at the state level. And you enlist moderate Republicans by talking to business people particularly small business owners and medium-sized um, business owners um, who have a lot of sway at the state level. So the way we could make that case was in the context of a labor shortage. And, and now I get to tell my Greg Pence story, which is that Greg Pence, Mike Pence's brother, took his seat in Congress. So I, um, I flew out to Washington to lobby Congress on behalf of Exodus, the refugee agency in Indianapolis. And we were granted an audience in every congressman, every Indiana congressman's office, except Greg Pence's. And he's a pretty hard right winger. Um, so we couldn't get in his office. So I'm flying home and I sit down on my seat and there's an empty middle seat and a guy in the window seat. And I'm like, oh, so yeah, what brings you to Washington? And he says, well, I'm a congressman. And I'm like, you're Greg Pence. And you're sitting next to me for the next two hours and you cannot move. So it was very awesome. So, um, so I got to make the pitch to him about refugees as a labor source. And here I, I recognize my own hypocrisy. Um, but I made the pitch to him in terms of labor. And he was saying to me, oh yeah, I had farmers in my office this morning saying they have crops they can't pick. They have land they can't put into production because they have no labor. He said, and I had manufacturers in my office this afternoon, and they're saying they could double their sales, but they can't get anyone to do assembly. And I kept saying, Greg, you know, I can have 1,500 workers in Indiana by Christmas, but I need you to tell Trump to lift the cap because the president sets the number of refugees who can be admitted. 
And, and, you know, interestingly, as kind of hard right as Greg Pence is, that argument made a lot of sense to him. Um, that, that refugees, because they're subject to so much security clearance, as opposed to undocumented immigrants who don't have any, that it would make more sense to attract refugees to Indiana than to let businesses pull in undocumented Mexicans. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Dominique Kenjanowski. So I'm going to, to, to maybe read it out loud for our recording. Uh, what may be expected in the imminent future regarding correlation of vaccines and refugees? Given that in due time, most of the society will be vaccinated, of course, would they be included seamlessly or would it cause a precedent? Well, you know, this is really interesting and we're about to get into these questions of who should be prioritized for vaccination. And, and the first real controversy has been over prisoners. Um, prisons are a real source of infection. Uh, COVID spreads rapidly there. Prisoners circulate between prisons and they come in and out of prisons and they infect their families. And, and despite all of that, Democrats and Republicans have been totally unwilling to vaccinate prisoners, which makes no sense from a public health perspective. You wanna vaccinate the people who are most likely to spread it. But the question has been about whether prisoners are morally worthy of being vaccinated ahead of 60 year olds or ahead of teachers. And, and I think when we get into, um, Talking about food systems workers, um, that's gonna be a big question, particularly when it comes to undocumented workers, but also to refugees. Um, should those people be vaccinated before American citizens? And I, I think we're gonna see public health imperatives and moral ideas about value and worth coming into real conflict and debate um, in the, in the case of meatpacking, because meatpacking is right behind prisons as a COVID super spreader site. So that's the first question. But I think once everybody's vaccinated, the, the food processing industry has decided that cheap labor, cheap disposable labor is preferable to investing in, in very expensive mechanization. Um, and so as long as they can pull in labor, they're gonna do that instead of using machines. So. I expect that we will have um, this problem of degraded labor for a considerable amount of time. One of the things that's interesting is I drove out to the meatpacking plant in Colorado when I was there in December um, and they have raised their wages by $4 an hour. So they're now paying something like $18.75 an hour, um, which in Colorado is for a blue collar job you know, it's not, you're not gonna get rich, but it's not a terrible wage. So they certainly are responding to the shortage of people willing to go into a, a COVID affected site with higher wages. So the question is, will they drop wages again when they can, when there's 115,000 people a year being coerced into low wage labor, will that in fact allow the meat packers to drop their wage rates? And I think it will. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. Well, super, I'm super happy mm -hmm. to take questions by email. Mm -hmm. If people would like to, um, uh, I'm at elcdunn at indiana.edu. And I hope very much that I might be in Warsaw next year. So fingers crossed. Yes. And I hope yes. to meet you all in person. Yes, we're hoping for that as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today in the in this kind of cold and and dark Polish evening. Uh, so <laughs> let me wish you happy. Uh, you know, have a nice day because it's it's just the beginning of your day, right? Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.